So today we're going to talk about two applications of magnetic fields. And first we'll talk about electric motors. And then after that, we'll talk about electric generators. So. And so first, I guess we'll define what those mean. And so for an electric motor, we're going to turn electric and magnetic energy into mechanical energy. And then an electric generator will turn mechanical work or mechanical energy into electrical energy. And so these are both things that are used in everyday life. If you think about your refrigerator that has a, an electric motor that helps keep everything cold. And then an electric generator is basically how all of the electricity that almost all of the electricity that we use is generated. Uh, with newer technologies like uh, solar technology, that's not the same as an electric generator, but almost every other kind of electric energy is uh, uses this kind of technology. So first we'll talk about motors. So we have this this loop of wire, and let's say the current is flowing clockwise. And this thing is free to rotate about this axis. And then we have a magnetic field. And let's say that it's out of the board. And now we're going to investigate what this magnetic field is going to do to each of these loops of wire in this uh, picture. So we'll call this one, two, three, four, five. 
and I guess four and five will pretty much do the same thing, but I guess we'll we'll show that. So, okay, so what happens when you have a current carrying wire in a magnetic field? So it's gonna feel a force. I L cross D. So first we're gonna look at each of these different current segments and find the magnetic force that that wire is going to experience. Okay, so Maybe I can squeeze that in over here. So the magnetic field point to the right. And then we'll redo all of these uh, right hand tools. So for F1, current points up, magnetic field points to the right. So you would get a force that's into the board, which would be in the negative Z direction. For F2, now magnetic field and current are in the same direction. So this force is zero. For force three, current is down, magnetic field is to the right. So you would get a force that's coming out of the screen, which is positive K hat direction. And then F4 and F5 are both zero. Because the current and the magnetic field are off by 180 degrees. So sine of 180 would be zero. So this could just be written like this. Okay, so now we, we only have two forces. Again, when you add up all of the forces in the Z direction, you get zero because the force one plus force three adds up to be zero. If we look at the distance between, I guess maybe I'll draw, I'll redraw the loop on the next, next slide. Okay, so here's our loop again. And we said that this, this was I1, I3, I two, five, I four. Okay. Uh, so we said that the force, oh, and then this loop is free to rotate about this axis. Uh, always the same as the So the rotation is, so um, like if, if your hand was the piece of paper and you held it flat, this is how it would rotate. Okay. 
So it's it's hard to draw that, but I'll I'll once once we finish this, I'll try to show what it would look like. Um, okay, so that's the axis of rotation. So then we'll go back to our uh, torque. And now we have only two forces to worry about. We've got a force that's going into the board over here, force one. And then over here, we have a force that's coming out of the screen, force three. So we'll do the same thing where we draw our R vector, which is pointing, let's see, if we point from the axis of rotation to the force. That would be R3. This would be R1. So torque one equals, so if we just look at the magnitude, this would be R F sine theta. So what is the distance? So I guess this distance R is going to be half the length of one of the segments of wire because the axis of rotation is right in the middle. So this would be L over two. And then the force is the magnetic force that we found earlier. And then the sine of 90 degrees is just one. So the magnitude of torque one is L over two times the magnetic force. And then for torque three, uh, we would get the same. And now we use the right-hand rule to figure out what direction that uh, torque is in. So for force one, R points to the left, uh, the magnetic force is into the board. So we would get a torque that points downward. So that is the direction of torque. And then for force three, R3 points to the right. The uh, force three is coming out of the board. So you would again get a torque that points downward. Uh, so downward is the negative J hat direction. And so now you see when you add your torques together, you get torque one plus torque three. Now your torques don't cancel. So you would get L times the magnetic force for the net torque. So the net force was zero, but the net torque is not zero. And now because you have a net torque, so to figure out what direction something is gonna rotate, you put your thumb in the direction of the torque and then wherever your fingers curl is the direction of the spin. So this arrow would be pointing This side, it's going into the board, and then it's coming out of the board. 
And so remember there was a, a magnetic field that was pointing to the right. And if we plug in the value for the force that we had, which was ILV, then we into this torque equation, then the net torque and this was in a negative J hat direction would be I L squared B in the negative J hat direction. So the takeaway from this is if you orient your magnetic field in such a, in, for example, the way that I have it here, then you can, and you have a current carrying loop, you can make that current carrying loop start to spin. Now, what you do with that spin depends on what you're trying to make. So if you were thinking about like a car or something, you can have uh, this spinning loop turn, for example, the wheels on your car. And that's how you can have like an electric car where you're turning electric energy into mechanical energy. So I think the takeaways from this are more conceptual, uh, just that this, the fact that we have all of these different cross products uh, in the end makes it so that this having the magnetic field and the currents oriented in this way will allow this thing to start rotating. <laughs> So in order to talk about electric generators, which is basically the inverse of this, where you take something spinning and if you put it in a magnetic field, then you can extract electricity from that setup. So what we just talked about was I put electrical energy in and I get mechanical energy out and that's a motor, a generator is I put mechanical energy in and I extract electrical energy. So that's what we're gonna talk about. And so before we talk about electric generators, we have to define some new terms. So the first thing I'm going to define is a flux, and this is going to be magnetic flux. It is written like this. So this is the Greek letter phi. and we would put a subscript B so that you know it's for magnetic fields. And the magnetic flux is B dot A, where B is the magnetic field, A is the, I guess, yeah, I'll call it surface area. And then remember that in physics, if I write this dot, that is a special kind of multiplication that we do between vectors. So this is a dot product. And so one interpretation of the dot product is just take your magnitudes and then multiply by the cosine of the angle between them. So a way to think about flux is just the amount of magnetic field 
passing through some area. So I'll write that down. So we've seen, if I just draw a magnetic field with some arrow, then you know what direction the magnetic field is pointing. Uh, what you might not be familiar with is what direction does an area vector point? And so I'll talk about that on the next slide. So the area vector, So if I take something simple like this square or this circle, the area vector, and it's up to how you want to define it. I'll just say that it's coming out of the board here. And so in words, the, the surface area vector is perpendicular to the surface. And so if you think about the square, it has some length in the x direction and some height in the y direction. So in order to be perpendicular to both the x and the y direction, I have to point in the z direction, which is why the surface area comes out of the board or out of the screen. So this is for two dimensions and you can get more complicated like in three dimensions if I drew a sphere. Then the surface area vector is going to point radially outward. Uh, so for this class, I think we'll stick to doing two-dimensional surfaces. And so uh, you'll only need to think about things like the square or the circle where whatever plane the object is in, the surface area vector will point out of that. Okay, so let me show some examples now for calculating a magnetic flux. So we said that flux was B dot A. So if I define my area like this, and I wanna know the flux that's flowing through this area in the magnetic field is like this, then my sine of the angle or cosine of the angle between these is 90 and cosine of 90 is 0 so i just get zero flux so the only way to get flux is to have the magnetic field and the surface area vector be in either the same direction 
or in opposite directions. And the units for magnetic flux are just the unit for magnetic field, which is Tesla times meters squared. So the units would be Tesla and then meters squared. So the reason that we are defining this magnetic flux is that due to Faraday's law, a Changing magnetic flux with respect to time will give you a voltage. And another way that you can think about that is that as long as you have some resistor in your circuit, then anytime you have a voltage, you also have a current. So as long as I have a change in my magnetic flux, I can produce a current in a circuit. So if we look at our equation for magnetic flux, you'll see that there are some things that we could change in order to get a changing flux, right? So we could do we could change the magnetic field with respect to time. Or we could change the area with respect to time. So it has to do with the dot product. So remember, phi can be B a cosine theta. So if we change the angle between B and A with respect to time, then we can also get a change in our magnetic flux. So these change, and the reason that this is Part of the reason this is all happening is due to calculus. So you wouldn't, we're not going to expect you to do that kind of calculus, but calculating a change in magnetic field over a change in time or a change in area over a change in time uh, is certainly something that you guys can be expected to do. The change in angle with respect to time gets a little trickier because uh, doing the derivative of cosine is not something that you guys would know how to do, 
Uh, but conceptually, it's something that you should remember. So there's three ways to change the magnetic flux, either changing the magnetic field, changing the area, or changing the angle between the magnetic field and the area. So we'll tie this back to how to generate a, an electric, how to generate electricity. And the picture that we'll draw looks similar to what we had before. Only now it's going to be in reverse, basically. So now instead of this already having a current flowing through it, We're still going to put it in some magnetic field. But now we're going to be the one supplying the torque to this loop that's free to rotate about this axis again. And so last time we had the torque pointing down, let's say this time the torque is going to point upwards. So if the torque is pointing up, then we're rotating it such that the, the force on this part of the wire is going into the board and the force on this part of the wire is coming out of the board. And so this thing will start to rotate. Now, if we look at the change in flux over change in time, we said that if we change the field or we change the area, we can get a, a, a voltage. But we're not changing the field or the area, but if we're spinning this thing, we are changing the angle between them. So this, and I'll write down what the derivative of cosine is. It turns out to be negative sine theta times sine theta uh, times. So this is what the actual derivative looks like. Uh, you don't need to know what d theta by dt means, but we can simplify that to be this quantity omega, which is just the rotation speed that we're spinning this uh, loop of wire at. Yes, yeah, so that, that, that's the next point that I was gonna to come to. The way that we're spinning it can be any kind of mechanical work. So you could imagine like just turning it by hand and then you would get tired. So you're, you would be expending your own energy to do that. Uh, and it was hard to imagine doing that for a whole city's worth of power, uh, but instead, uh, there are a bunch of different ways that you can make something spin. So if you think about hydroelectric power, what you're doing is you're taking the water, you start it at the top of the dam and you let it fall to the bottom. That change in kinetic energy is what is gonna make your, uh, this loop of wire spin basically. So you're turning the energy of the river into electrical energy. 
And that's basically the process for most forms of energy, even like nuclear energy. There's a lot of like complicated physics that's going on to make a nuclear reaction happen. But then once that reaction happens, all you do is you take the energy, you heat up water, that water turns into steam, and those the steam turns turbines, which are basically just these loops that spin. So you take something really complicated like nuclear energy, and you just heat up water to spin a loop of wire to make electricity. Um, same. Similar kind of thing with coal power plants, any kind of fossil fuel, you're just burning that fossil fuel to heat up water to spin turbines to make electricity. Um, wind turbines, you have a spinning blade, that spinning blade can spin this loop of wire that'll make electricity. So the only thing that's really different is solar power, and that uses something called the photoelectric effect, which we'll learn about towards the end of class. Uh, but so this is very important uh, for your everyday lives. And this is how we generate electricity. Um, next time, we'll talk about this formula in a bit more detail. But I wanted to highlight something. So this whole thing was called Faraday's law. This was voltage and changing the magnetic flux with respect to time. This negative sign out in front is so important that it has its own law called Lenz's law. And we'll talk about the implications of that negative sign next time.